All right, so continuing, I was confused. What, what, what on earth is this theorem doing here? Well, um, O'Neill's just taking a second here to uh, smell the roses, so to speak, and to apply um, some of the things we've learned about total Gaussian curvature to say somewhat surprising things about curves, um, just really this one thing. Uh, and so the, the more interesting, well, in my opinion, more interesting thing we're going to talk about next is how we can define angles on a surface in terms of essentially intrinsic um, reasoning. So anyway, first this little theorem I will go through quickly. A simple closed curve alpha in R3 has total curvature. So the total curvature um, of, a, of, a, of a curve you, you get by integrating the, um, the Frenet curvature uh, with respect to arc length, all right? And so the, this theorem is that uh, that total curvature of a curve has to be greater than or equal to 2 pi. So, well, and it's a closed curve, all right? Simple closed curve. Of course, for, some, for something like a helix that just goes on and on without end, the total curvature would be infinite, I suppose. Or you wouldn't define it, whatever. Anyway, so I'm going to follow O'Neill, as usual. And he, he says, basically, make a tube, a tube around the curve alpha, all right, as, we, as described in a exercise number 17 in section 5.4. So here's a patch on the tube, all right? Basically just like kind of like thickening the curve. We talked about thickening a surface to get a ribbon tube is kind of like that, except two-dimensional, uh, you know. Well, excuse me. It's it's a surface though, right? It's not, it's not, it's like just the skin of the tube. It's not a solid tube, right? Anyway, it is shown back um, in an in exercise that the Gaussian curvature is minus kappa of u cosine uh, v over or nu um, divided by epsilon uh, times parentheses one minus the you know um, Frenet curvature uh, epsilon cosine v, and so the um, the Gaussian curvature is positive on the image of the patch, right where. The um, excuse me, where the patch, <coughs> excuse me, we have zero less than u less than l and minus pi, uh, excuse me, pi over two to three pi over two for for v. Um, l is the length of alpha. So arc length, I I would suppose, but um, cosine v is less than zero on that. Um, on that uh, that domain. So the the function w, the square root of e g minus f squared, uh, in this particular case, is what? Um, it's this right here. All right. So in other words, this factor. Again, cancels with, man, it's just like the other thing we just looked at for the torus, remember, when we looked at KDM for the torus, it was again this kind of thing, like this ugly denominator thing cancels with the, 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 um, the factor next to du dv for dm. So anyway, they cancel and they just left, left us with kappa of u cosine v, and then, of course, um, this integrates uh, to... Uh, the cosine integrates to 2, and it just leaves us with the integral from 0 to L of cap of u du. In other words, the integral of the um, Frenet curvature. Oops, I'm starting to get out of screen with respect to arc length. And then O'Neill argues that the um, Gaussian curvature k is greater than or equal to 0. Um, and the uh, Gauss map, right, is onto, um, therefore, the integral of the Gaussian curvature over the surface, over the tube, is greater than or equal to 4 pi. Because uh, if it's onto, it has to at least hit the whole sphere once, right? And um, so there you have it. This is greater than or equal to 4 pi divided by 2, and there's a the theorem. All right. Anyway, so I want to talk a little bit about angle measure along a surface. If you have a surface M 
with the unit normal u, and if you have v as a tangent to m, all right, then j of v equal to u cross v is again a tangent vector to the surface because if it's perpendicular to u, that means it's on the surface, right? And certainly u cross v is something which is perpendicular to u. And so that's orthogonal to v as well. So it gets you, for a given non-zero direct, non-zero vector, you get another vector which is non-zero and perpendicular. So that's a good, good thing to build angles off of, right? You need some kind of pair of nice perpendicular directions in the surface. Once you have that pair of perpendicular directions, you can look at other vectors and build them based on, you know, how much of this way and how much of that way you need. Now I have some nonsense in the notes here about uh, traces and angles, but that's really kind of beside the point. Wait, this is two-dimensional. All right, so, um, well, really more to the point, this J, so if we, if we have, if I have um, frame E1, uh, j of e1 would be u cross e1, which would be e2. j of e2 would be u cross e2, which would be minus e1. So the matrix with respect to um, a frame, e1, e2, uh, adapted to the surface, of course, the tangent frame, the matrix would just be 0, minus 1, 1, 0, which I know and recognize as the matrix of the imaginary unit in the left regular representation of complex numbers. But I, I think I'm digressing. Um, anyway, so the point is that's a rotation by pi over 2. So um, we can use this, this J operation to build a, a sense of angle on the surface. Let's, let's, let's go through it then. So V and W unit vector fields, uh, unit, unit tangent vectors on tangent space to P at M, where M is oriented, a number phi is the oriented angle from v to w provided that w is cosine of phi times v plus the sine of phi times j of v. Remember v um, gives me sort of like, think of that as like the x direction, j of v has to be the y direction. Now here's a picture that I drew of all this. Uh, again, okay, I guess I'm, here's the definition again. <laughs> okay. Um, this uniquely defines phi for zero less than phi less than two pi. Here's a, an attempt at a picture. So yeah, you're unit, unit normal. Here's your v. It's of unit length. J of v is by construction, you know, u uh, crossed into v. I can't do it, but that's j of v. And so you take any other w, any other tangent vector, you can build it from a linear combination of cosine phi times v plus sine phi times j of v. And, and so that also uniquely defines phi in order to um, get that. So, and you can check, of course, that the, um, the length of cosine of v, um, v plus sine of phi j of v is equal to 1. Um, I don't think it's equal to 1. I think it's equal to v. I think I've lost my, there's a, there's a v dot, oh my goodness gracious. So out from this, j of v dot j of v is v dot v. So there's like all of this times v dot v. And so this is just 1 times the square root of v dot v. Well, that's the length of v, all right? Which um, makes sense, I suppose. All right. Well, remember w. Oh, I'm an idiot. What was the, what was V? V was a, stooge. <laughs> v was a unit vector. Okay. Uh, oh yeah, I guess I could keep reading. Sorry, I'm off the, off the screen, but you'll see what I'm talking about soon enough. So I was like, oh, I'm missing my V dot V, but well, there was length was one. So, all right. Anyway, so here's a lemma. Alpha be a curve on an oriented surface M, V and W non-vanishing tangent vector fields on the curve, then there's a differentiable function phi on the on I such that for each T and I, phi of T is an oriented angle from V of T to W T. In other words, you can compare the angle between vector fields along a curve and a surface. Um, and the proof is just using this J construction again. So um, non-vanishing uh, 
tangent vector fields. Why am I assuming the length of them is 1? Oh, I said without loss of generality, suppose that the length was 1. Fine. Um, so V comma J of V is a frame field on alpha. And then you get the W is equal to that um, where this is the F and that is the G. I suppose I buy this. J of V is definitely perpendicular to V, so J and V and V, v and J of V give you an orthonormal basis because we assume V is unit length. And then um, once you have this identity, if V and W have non-zero length, then you can put those factors back in and, and get it, I suppose. So continuing the proof I say here. So 1 is w dot w, which was f squared plus g squared, and then we can apply exercise 12 of section 2.1 to obtain a differentiable function phi, such that f is equal to cosine phi and g is equal to sine phi. It then follows w of t is equal to cosine phi of t, v of t plus sine of t, j of v of t. That is that phi of t is the oriented angle from v of t to w of t along alpha. All right. Um, Anyway, I would encourage you to obviously read carefully read this part of O'Neill. We do need this notion of, of oriented angle as we study the gauss binet theorem. So it's it's not just a... Uh, we will use this idea again later. So just to point out, so some natural choices. If you have a surface and it's oriented, you can use positively oriented patches, um, DM, um, and positively oriented frame fields. In this case, uh, dm is theta 1, which is theta 2. Moreover, if you have a unit tangent vector, then u, j of u is a positively oriented frame. Moreover, for any non-vanishing vector field on m, we can define a positively oriented frame field by just normalizing the, you know, normalizing, you just normalize the frame field, normalize the field, and then feed it to the rotation, uh, rotate by 90 degrees. Um, J, which is, you know, based on the cross product. Um, there it is. Now we use the cross product to get this, but if you think about it, you could really do the same um, without directly using the cross product. But anyway, more, more on that as it becomes a clearer question. I think, oh, hey, check it out. So that's it for this lecture. Um, again, sorry for the break in format and Sorry for not being more careful here, but uh, the show must go on. We still have other things to get to this summer, so thanks.